a thank you to everyone for joining us for another virtual town hall. We are incredibly excited to see all of you. And this is a very special edition of our town hall as it is an election preview edition. So I know it's top of mind for a lot of folks. And so we wanted to put a program together to really just talk about some of the issues, uh, answer any questions that, that hopefully we, we can and get a discussion going. So before we get started, just a few quick reminders. Keep yourself on mute if you aren't speaking, just so we don't have any additional background noise. Um, I am Rachel Robinson, Vice President of Mass Medic, and it's, it's just really great to see all of you again. If you have questions, we absolutely encourage them. So please feel free to utilize the chat button at the bottom and to type your questions in throughout the program. We'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, and if it makes sense, we'll, we'll kind of pause in between. So unless anyone has anything to add, I'd like to start off by introducing Brian Scogland of Viva to give us a little bit of information about an upcoming program they have. Great, thanks so much, Rachel. Let me just share my screen here. Okay, so uh, thanks again, everybody. I'm Brian Scogland. I am a director of strategy with Viva Systems. Um, longtime member of the medical device community here in Massachusetts, uh, Mass Medic member, going back to my Boston Scientific days. Um, and I come by way of uh, Halloran Consulting Group, also in the Boston area, serving medical device clients, quality and regulatory type of activities. Um, I've recently joined Viva Systems, and if you're not familiar, Viva is a software provider for life sciences companies, very, very well known and established in the pharmaceutical industry, and we're working towards the same on the medical device side. So I'm here today to talk about our medical device and diagnostics summit that we're hosting virtually for the first time. It's online. It's next week, next uh, Wednesday and Thursday, the 28th and the 29th. Um, and Viva makes life science software uh, along the clinical regulatory and quality pillars. So it's really from product development all the way through commercialization, even all the way to the review of promotional materials. So anything and everything in between, we have a, a connected uh, connected vault, we call it, Viva Vault, where all these um, separate functions actually can integrate and cooperate seamlessly. So that's our big appeal is that you can work across and you can eliminate a lot of the silos traditional and medical device and diagnostics companies. So for our summit, we have uh, more than 30 sessions, which are led by industry experts. We have companies represented like Alcon, Baxter Health, Boston Scientific, Cook Medical, Edwards, uh, and Roche Diagnostics, just to name a handful. And of course, we're hoping, uh, hosting deep dive sessions in our software applications, and we'll have some opportunities to network and have some separate discussions with some of your peers. We're really excited about our uh, opening keynote. So we have four uh, leading CMO or CMOs from four leading medical device and diagnostics manufacturers here. You can see um, they're gonna be hosting a panel discussion on the impacts of the global pandemic on patient care in the industry in the short term, and then some of their long-term lasting perspectives on the impact of the pandemic. Um, so if you'd like to find out more, you can visit viva.com and find our Med Device Summit page, um, which will have the full agenda, a list of all the speakers, and you can also register there. So I encourage you to register. Anybody out there in the um, Med Device and Diagnostics world hasn't heard of Viva. If you have heard of Viva, we're doing really exciting things in the industry. So uh, with that, I hope that uh, we'll, you'll join us next week online. Thanks, Brian. So yeah, if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to Brian or to MassMedic. The event is also listed on our MassMedic events page and it's been featured in our newsletters the last few weeks. So if you have any trouble finding the leak link, please don't hesitate to look there and to reach out to us. I think this is a great time then to kick things off and hand it over to Brian Johnson to introduce our two speakers from ML Strategies. Um, and just a quick note to say thank you to Viva and ML Strategies, right? We could not do what we do without our members and with their support. So really do appreciate everything that they've been doing. So thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks Rachel and thank you, uh, Brian. It's uh, great to uh, see you again in, the, in this new incarnation. I know it's an exciting opportunity for you and I know uh, Viva is uh, doing some really, really interesting stuff in the medical device space. This is a new entry for them, but they've been a very established partner, uh, a provider in pharma life sciences. So. Um, it's just, it's really, uh, we were talking earlier uh, just about the sort of the growth of this software as a service aimed towards helping 
people develop medical technology and how big a market that is and how fast it's growing. So clearly uh, they made a great decision bringing you on board. So thanks again. Uh, so I wanted to, uh, when we talked about this initially, um, you know, election previews are kind of a dime a dozen in, in, in some respects when you get to this time of year. Uh, but, you know, and, and every election cycle, they say this is the most important election in a lifetime or a generation. And, you know, they all are in some respects because all elections have consequences. Uh, but I think in particular for the med tech industry, when I called Anthony and asked him if he'd be interested in doing this program, we, you know, we sort of said, well, what is there to be said that hasn't already been sort of said? And, you know, a lot of what, a lot of the action in the uh, locally for sort of political purposes really was centered around the primary on September 1st. But then we started really kind of digging into this and realizing the, uh, the dramatic implications for healthcare. Um, that are going to occur within the next uh, few weeks. Um, you know, immediate, not only the election, which will set the sort of the tone for how we're going to look at the healthcare in the future, but also the, the Supreme Court uh, taking up the Affordable Care Act um, in the first week of November. And sort of quickly, Anthony and I realized, oh my gosh, this is actually an incredibly uh, important moment for our industry. And we need to really kind of understand what is on what is at stake and what is on the ballot and how much of med tech and healthcare is on the ballot um so with that with that thought in mind uh, i i tapped anthony DeMaio, who's with our wonderful uh, lobbying and strategy firm ml strategies um uh, they're a, a global firm uh he's out of their washington dc office they have a local office up here in boston um the thing about ml strategies is uh, everyone I've worked with over there is incredibly smart, really understands the topics, really takes the time to learn um, our industry. And, and I, I just can't say enough about them. So, you know, I would, I would highly recommend them if you're looking for some lobbying and strategy firms. But today I'm going to hand over um, the presentation tools to Anthony and his colleague Christian Field, and they're going to take us through the preview. Um, and then we'll uh, do a little bit of Q and A because I know some we're going to bubble up with some questions after. So why don't you fire those into the chat bot as we go? And uh, you know if uh, we'll we'll ask the questions at the end unless something really kind of pops up. But Anthony and Christian, why don't you guys take it from here? Thank you, Brian, and, and thank you for uh, those kind words as always. I'm going to share my screen now if I can do it seamlessly. After seven months, you'd think we'd figure this out. Um, as, as Brian said, this is, uh, this is not our first um, uh, town hall with Mass Medic, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be back, and, and it's nice to see so many of you uh, and your familiar faces. So thank you for having me, and thank you for uh, inviting also my colleague Christian, who I think is um, just an invaluable uh, asset to not only our firm, but to clients like Mass Medic. Um, uh, and and we'll, we'll find out why as we go through this presentation. But uh, <clears throat> Christian is a veteran of the Hill and, and truly a, uh, a creature of, of both houses, but most recently the Senate, which I think is where we're going to see a lot of, um, uh, or, or, or there's potential to see a lot of change and um, the most far-reaching consequences in this election. So that's us. Um, and I think uh, before we get into sort of the my favorite part of these presentations, the wild speculation, we're going to do a little bit of um, looking back at the primary as Brian has sort of um, teed up uh, uh, with a, my favorite political maxim from Speaker O'Neill, all politics is local. And insofar as we are a uh, Massachusetts-centered um, uh, group, I thought we'd take a look at what happened here on the competitive election day, which was September 1st, um, and, and what implications that primary might have had. Um, as, as everybody knows and was sort of national news, Ed Markey um, defended his seat in the U.S. Senate by uh, beating Joe Kennedy fairly soundly um, when all was said and done in that primary. Um, he ran on, among other things, a, a Medicare for All message, 
um, and and sort of the true progressive label probably held up endorsements from from people like uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. So I think that he's he's looking um, he's looking forward to another six years in the Senate as a uh, as a as a um, newly reborn outsider political uh, uh, progressive disruptor, um, which I think will be interesting for the dynamic here in Massachusetts. To replace Joe Kennedy, who had to vacate his seat uh, in the fourth congressional district, Jake Auchincloss defeated a field of uh, nine total Democrats, um, and and again fairly soundly by two thousand votes, a lot a lot uh, a, a lot wider margin than we saw in the last open seat two years ago. Um, did not go to a recount like Laurie Trahan's did. Uh, he, as many of you probably know, and and if you haven't, I highly recommend getting in getting in touch with him and getting in front of him, particularly if you're in that district, but but really anywhere in the state. He is committed to being um, an ally in Congress to life sciences generally and, and med tech in particular. So Brian and I have had a couple of conversations with him. Um, very impressive young man, I think will be a, um, a star in the Congress. Uh, he's gonna have a, a tough reelection in two years, but assuming he can get through that, um, you know he could be he could be in Congress for as long as he likes that seat. He's a very, very impressive and talented uh, politician. Now, there were only a couple of other competitive, or, or or not even competitive, I should say, but there were a couple of other contested primaries. Richie Neal, uh, Chairman Neal, uh, out in the western part of the state in the first congressional district, had probably his most uh, serious primary challenger in his um, in his career. Uh, Alex Morris was a, is the mayor of Holyoke, uh, one of the cities in, in that district. But um, despite sort of some, some concern over that, uh, uh, Mr. Neal defeated his opponent pretty soundly and uh, I think is going to come back to Congress uh, stronger than ever, um, having, uh, having sort of asserted his, his popularity. And, and, and I think more than anything else, his message, which is a a very um, uh, institutionalist approach to governing and legislating. Um, Alex Morris, for his part, ran sort of as a as the progressive answer to that, with uh, endorsements from the likes of AOC and others. Seth Moulton had a had a primary with two Democrats. Um, uh, did not really register. I think he won with seventy four percent of the vote. Uh, likewise, Stephen Lynch had a primary. And uh, the others listed there at the bottom, McGovern, Trahan, Clark, Presley, and Keating ran uncontested. Um, and so while there's no real uh, competitive general election for uh, a, a seat in Massachusetts coming up in a week, um, there are a couple of ballot questions that are interesting. I thought it would be worth mentioning. Number one is right to repair. Of course, this is an automotive industry issue, but it being analogous to um, our industry, it's it's kind of interesting to watch. And of course, ranked choice voting, which you he, I think see fewer commercials uh, on television, but maybe uh, even more important, um, this would change the way uh, voters select candidates, particularly in primaries, um, giving you an opportunity to select not only your first choice, but your second choice, and um, uh, the, the proponents of it kind of um, bill it as giving you giving you more power in your vote. Certainly, it would have had an effect on the outcome of, say, this fourth district primary um, uh, just this past September. It is a it's an issue that's come up in other parts of the country. Maine has it now, um, and it is, I think. It's a long way from being implemented, even if it gets passed. Uh, it's going to be challenged in the courts. It's going to have to be legislated and all the rest, but interesting to watch. So now I think we can move to the national stage. Um, I think uh, this is not real wild speculation. Control of the U.S. House is really not in play. The Democrats have a, a pretty durable majority, um, but I think it's likely that that majority will even increase um, and Democrats may pick up a couple of seats. Um, 
maybe in, in Texas and elsewhere, um, and certainly not lose any ground. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that Nancy Pelosi will be reelected Speaker of the House. Um, she's been uh, pretty much validated in all of her strategy over the past uh, two years as Speaker, dealing with this president and, and his uh, negotiators on various bills, including uh, the COVID-19 stimulus bills and the ongoing negotiations with Secretary Mnuchin. Interesting, though, and bringing it back to the local, um, Catherine Clark announced that she would be running for assistant speaker, which is a relatively new leadership position. Um, it's sort of ill-defined, which I think plays in the advantage of someone like Catherine Clark, who I think is a, a, probably one of the most talented um, politicians and, and, uh, and legislators in the Congress and could really make that position her own. Um, she's running against two other uh, Democrats, uh, and it's and it's sort of unknown, you know, how she's doing. But she did pick up some really key endorsements in that race. Uh, we won't know until sometime around Thanksgiving, when the caucus gets together after the election, um, who will prevail on that. But it would be interesting, and I think very valuable to Massachusetts companies and constituents to have someone like uh, Catherine Clark in leadership. So we're watching that closely. Um, and the last bullet point there you see, uh, for those of you in the third district, you probably know Lori Tran pretty well by now. Um, Massachusetts has always had, or I shouldn't say always, but for decades has had a seat on the Energy and Commerce Committee, which is where uh, my colleague Christian worked for about 10 years in the House. Um, it is the committee with the widest jurisdiction in the House um, and covers, among other things, the FDA and uh and through the health subcommittee generally um ed markey held that seat for for many years and joe kennedy had it uh, most recently he had to give it up of course as he had to give up his seat in congress to run for senate so laura trahan is uh angling to join the committee and it looks like she will get on it and uh it looks like she will use that seat to be an ally again to life sciences um on the committee of jurisdiction so that's very exciting um and I think will be great, particularly for you know, for members in her district, but but elsewhere too. And Christian, I don't. If you want to say anything about E and C, by all means, um, I don't want to spend too much time on it. But no, I, I would just echo um, Anthony's uh, sort of assessment of the committee. It, it actually probably has the widest jurisdiction in all of Congress, both House and the Senate. Um, and it, uh, the, the members on the committee are extremely influential, uh, not only on FDA matters, but all healthcare matters. I mean, they really are the driving force. It's the, on healthcare, uh, jurisdiction is split between the Ways and Means Committee, which has jurisdiction uh, over large parts of Medicare uh, and entitlement programs, uh, but all of the public health uh, jurisdiction lies under health, energy, and commerce. So definitely keep an eye on, on what that committee is doing. Yeah. And of course, you know, we mentioned Richie Neal uh, uh, prevailing in his primary and coming back to be chair of Ways and Means. Um, I, I, I neglected to mention, um, always been a, a great um, ally of this industry and particularly in Massachusetts. So um, to have those two, uh, I think, business savvy members uh, in positions of jurisdiction uh, for this state in this delegation will be. Uh, Will be great. Um, now we're sort of into the speculation part, my favorite part, I think everybody's favorite part. Um, the Senate is largely up in the air. Um, right now, Republicans control the chamber with 53 seats, um, but there are a lot of competitive Senate races this year. And um, you know, I'm sure everyone here on the phone is well aware. Um, it's, it, it, it is well within striking distance for Democrats to take control and for Chuck Schumer to take over as a majority leader. I think it's, it's a foregone conclusion that Doug Jones does not keep that seat in Alabama, and so Republicans will pick that one up. But if the race were today, according to the polls, uh, Republicans would probably lose seats in Arizona, Colorado, Iowa, and Maine. Um, and and really there are more within the realm of possibility. So if just those five seats flipped, 
uh, you'd be at 50 50 and the vice president would be in a position to break ties. Um, and of course, then that goes to our next slide and who wins the presidency. But it's also possible that the Democrats win, you know, five or six or even seven seats and, uh, and then take a strong majority regardless of, of who wins the White House. Um, yeah, I would, I would, Anthony, real quick, I, I, would, I would also keep an eye on Georgia, keep an eye on North Carolina, Keep an eye, and where, where it's really surprising this election is that states that you would never think um, would be up for grabs for Democrats. Uh, there's talk that some members may be in trouble. Senator Cornyn out of Texas, uh, there's talk that he might be in trouble. If you've noticed in the press, he's actually started to distance himself from the president on uh, certain matters, uh, COVID being very key to that. Um, Montana might be up for grabs of all places where um, Former Governor Bullock is running a very strong race. So there are there are some red, Georgia is another state. There, there are some red states that ordinarily would not be up for grabs for Democrats that uh, you may want to keep an eye on on election night. So sorry, Anthony, I didn't mean to interrupt. But. No, not at all. I think that's, I mean, that, that's true. And, and, you know, people talk about Lindsey Graham being in trouble. I think Jamie Harrison has run pretty much, uh, it has been a masterclass in staying on message. We'll say that about his campaign. He has done a very good job of that. You know, six months ago, I would have said there's absolutely no chance that a Democrat can win South Carolina. And now I said, you know, maybe there's a 20% chance. I don't know. So um, good points all around. And so now the exciting part, um, not that it isn't all exciting to people like me, Christian and others, um, the, the White House is looking more and more like it's Biden's to lose. Um, but of course, we, we said the same thing about Hillary Clinton. So, so we're not gonna know until at the earliest um, election night and, 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 and more likely uh, a week or two or hopefully not longer than that. Um, it may come down to just one or two states like it has in the last few elections and Pennsylvania certainly tops that list. Um, but I think what makes what makes it interesting for this group is healthcare, and healthcare really independent of the pandemic remains the top issue in this campaign. Um, uh, you know, coverage and and drug pricing really dominate the conversation, um, but implications kind of trickle from there towards this industry, and I think you're well aware of them. Um, in the money race, which kind of is a, a proxy for, for where support is, um, both MedTech and Pharma uh, favor Biden in, in large numbers. Employees in both of those industries have given to the Biden campaign uh, at least two to one. So, you know, if, that, if that's an indication as to where the, the industries think, um, you know, the safe future is or the, or the, or the safer future is, uh, it looks like they're uh, they're they're with Biden, and of course, sort of hanging over everything is the California v. Texas case, um, which will be heard in the Supreme Court exactly one week after the election takes place. Brian alluded to this uh, uh, just before we we began the slides. Uh, it will be among the first cases that newly confirmed and. Looks like that's going to happen on Monday. Uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett will hear, and uh, in all likelihood, that tilts the court towards the Texas position. Um, and, and you know, the lawyers on this call, you know, I'm sure know and can explain this in much greater detail than 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 we'd be able to. But really, what's what's at stake in this case is the future of the Affordable Care Act, and there's a there's a few different potential outcomes. Um, you know, to go full Texas or to go full, you know, federal government, which is, has joined the Texas side of the law, the, the uh, lawsuit would strike down not only the individual mandate, but uh, protection for pre-existing conditions. Um, uh, it's also possible that the, that the court decides that just the individual mandate is unconstitutional, um, but the insurance protections are, are, you know, can stand. Uh, it's also possible that the court decides that, um, you know, Texas doesn't have standing to, to bring the case. But uh, that's, I think, much, much less likely now that uh, the court has sort of tilted. So 
um, all of that sort of hangs over not only the White House but the Senate um, as we as we kind of come down the final stretch here, um, and certainly in the first six months of the of the next term, um, because we're not we we. We won't hear a decision on that um, probably before June of 2021. So um, be on pins and needles for a few months there. Um, have a, um, a Christian jump in here who's been in uh, you know, making legislation and, and passing legislation in lame duck sessions uh, for years now, but I think um, it's worth mentioning what we expect to happen in the Congress between November 3rd and, and uh, swearing in in January, or really Christmas when they go away for, for recess. Um, it's possible that we do finally get this pandemic relief bill. Um, it seems unlikely that it's gonna happen, you know, now before the election, um, you know, people are calling it CARES 2.0, it might be called something different, but but what's for sure is Nancy Pelosi is not coming down off of a number um, as big as $2 trillion in, in spending, and that's for uh, testing, um, shoring up state and municipal budgets, and, uh, and some small business assistance. I know we did, a, we did a town hall that many of you might have joined um, early on in the pandemic to discuss the CARES Act and PPP loans and, and other sort of uh, assistance to business. Um, and, uh, and, and government investment in the clinical response to the pandemic, uh, I suspect and I hope that we'll be doing something similar before the end of the year. That would depend on uh, the deal coming together in the lame duck. And uh, as Christian might be able to elaborate on, that, that's sort of a function of the election results, you know, and if the election is, you know, even certified and, and decided, in a timely fashion, um, you know, we might be we might be in limbo for a couple of weeks, which kind of shortens that window to 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 do any legislating. So we also have uh, a couple of must pass things in, in the lame duck, including appropriations. Uh, this is to fund the federal government. We're in a continuing resolution right now, which basically just keeps funding levels the same as they were in the last fiscal year, um, and that. CR, as it's, as it's known, is, uh, is set to expire on December 11th. So they'll have to do something else to sort of get us through um, uh, the new year. And it could be another short-term CR, or it could be something bigger like an omnibus. And I, again, I defer to Christian on um, your thoughts on, on both of these things. No, I think I think you summed it up uh, quite well. I, I think that the, the key this time around will be um, Senate Republicans. Uh, I mean, it's the key right now, but it, it'll, it'll, it's, it will be interesting to see whether or not they remain resolute in lame duck on no further additional uh, fiscal spending. Um, I mean, Senator McConnell, uh, you know, simply at this point does not have enough support from his own conference, uh, fiscal conservatives that, that believe that there, there simply shouldn't be any more, any more spending. Uh, and whether or not that those members change their mind in lame duck, I think still is an open question. A lot of it will depend on uh, who's coming back in January and what their priorities are um, on their way out the door. So, so um, this is, speaking of January, sort of where we get to the, the truly wild speculation and, and kind of go through a few different um, likely outcomes of this election and what it means for med tech um, or what they would mean for med tech. I think the, the first outcome, uh, these are in no particular order of likelihood, but the first one worth addressing is uh, a, a Trump re-election. Um, I think regardless of who controls the Senate in January, if President Trump remains in the White House, we're likely to see um, gridlock on on healthcare policy he's you know been committed to lowering drug prices um but we haven't seen um well we haven't seen the senate move on it um so we'll you know we've, we've seen the house pass a bill we haven't seen the senate pass a bill he's been committed to undermining or or 
finding a way to invalidate the Affordable Care Act, including through uh, the California v. Texas case that we discussed, but there isn't exactly a plan to uh, replace it with anything. So again, that case looms large and, and under, under any circumstance, but certainly under the, the Trump win scenario, what happens to coverage and what's the pressure to, uh, to address it, um, particularly if the entire law or, or the far reaching decision is handed down in June. Um, I think, uh, I don't know, Christian, do you, do you have anything to add? Is that, do, do you think that's fair Democrat or Republican control of the, of the Senate? We're looking at gridlock. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, scenario number two, I think is, is very similar. Um, this is Biden wins the White House, but Republicans maintain control of the Senate. Um, as we discussed earlier, this is less likely just based on the numbers of Biden. It looks like if Biden wins, he's gonna, his, his coattails are gonna carry the Senate too. Um, but in this scenario, we are looking at, you know, or, or it's, it's absolutely clear we're looking at gridlock um, uh, just because Biden, or, or I should say Democrats control the White House and the House uh, doesn't mean we should expect any more movement on expanding coverage as long as uh, Mitch McConnell is, in, is, is controlling the floor of the U.S. Senate. Um, and again, you know, we'll see what the, what the California uh, case uh, adds in terms of pressure for, for the Congress, but that won't be for several months, maybe even beyond. And now the final, and I think the most exciting and, and most consequential uh, potential outcome is is a Biden win and um, the Democrats take control of the Senate. This is um, this is the situ this is the situation where Democrats are going to be under a lot of pressure to deliver on some of these health care promises. And if you've been following the the uh, the presidential, which I'm sure you have, um, you've heard from Biden that that he is not in favor of Medicare for all, despite the fact that you know many now in the party are. Um, uh, he is absolutely committed to shoring up the ACA and trying to bring back and <clears throat> bring back some of the stability that has been uh, undermined over the past few years, um, and also establishing a public option, which um, we know is very difficult and um, I think politically challenging um, due to the competition it would create in the private market. Um, and to accomplish some of these uh, legislative priorities that, that have been promised, but um, have been, I think, stymied by Senate procedure in the past, there's going to be a lot of pressure um, to eliminate the, the legislative filibuster. And I think if Democrats control 55 seats, which is sort of a, you know, a reach scenario, um, that pressure is going to be very, very high. And I'll, I'll turn to Christian for, for sort of the nuance of, of Senate procedure. But basically today, um, if you don't have 60 votes in the Senate, you're not gonna pass your, your bill. Um, but there is talk of moving that down to 51 and, and what that might mean for, uh, for healthcare in particular. Yeah, so, so, so the filibuster <clears throat> uh, sort of has a long complicated history. Um, there's nothing in the Constitution that requires uh, 60 votes in order to get anything done in the Senate. This is, these are all just Senate rules that the Senate itself established. The filibuster was originally meant to simply extend discussion and debate on a particular bill. Uh, and over the years, it's really evolved instead into the minority being able to uh, stop bills from passing uh, unless you are able to reach a 60 vote um, threshold. It's known as a cloture vote, um, where after, <clears throat> after you, you need 60 votes in order to end debate on a particular bill, and then you go to final passage, and then at final passage, uh, you only need a majority vote. So when you talk about ending the filibuster, you're talking about ending the 60 vote cloture vote that ends debate on any particular bill. Um, and while there's been pressure for a long time to get rid of the filibuster, uh, uh, it sort of met a crescendo just recently uh, as a result of the Barrett nomination. Um, 
the, the logic being that uh, when President Obama had nominated uh, Merrick Garland at the Supreme Court, um, Senator McConnell and Senate Republicans refused to even have a hearing for Merrick Garland, uh, and his uh, nomination languished. Uh, uh, president Trump became president, uh, and then Neil Gorsuch was immediately uh, nominated uh, for Justice Scalia's spot, and then he was he was then um, uh, pat he was then uh, passed by the Senate. The Senate actually eliminated the filibuster in order to get Gorsuch, Gorsuch through the Senate. Uh, and I should mention, by the way, that Democrats were the one that started this. It was actually Harry Reid back in 2013, I believe it was, that eliminated the filibuster for judicial nominees, non-Supreme Court judicial nominees, and executive nominees. Uh, he contended at the time that uh, Republicans were unfairly blocking uh, Obama's uh, executive appointments and judicial nominees. And so uh, Senator Reid was the first actually to go nuclear uh, and end the filibuster. <clears throat> Senate Republicans then extended that uh, end of the filibuster for, uh, for Neil Gorsuch's uh, nomination to the Supreme Court. Uh, and then with, if Barrett is confirmed, uh, the thinking is, is that if the Senate flips, uh, part of the response from Senate Democrats will be to end the filibuster once and for all on all, all things in order to, to uh, not only pass uh, healthcare legislation, but everything from climate change legislation to a uh, num number of other um, uh, democratic priorities. So certainly something to watch. That and, and court backing. I mean, there's even talk about uh, expanding the Supreme Court as well as a result of, of the Barrett nomination. So it could get messy. Uh, it could get messy in terms of Senate procedure uh, and the institution of democracy uh, next Congress. Thanks, Christian. I think there's no question that this is the this is the outcome that generates the the most action. Um, and I think uh, if if there's one takeaway, it's um, advocacy is going to be more important than ever. Um, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to rely on um, uh, the the inaction or the you know the 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 sort of what we've come to expect from the Senate, which is a very slow, if not immovable object, um, should the Democrats decide that that they they need to uh, they they need to acquiesce to the pressure and 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 eliminate the filibuster to move their priorities, um, you know. So we, we've talked a lot about coverage, um, mostly because as, as anybody who's been in the industry for a period of time knows and remembers well. Um, part of expanding coverage is paying for it. And the last time we expanded coverage in the ACA, we paid for it with a, uh, at least in part, with a, with a device excise tax. Um, we were only just getting past that with a permanent repeal, um, but could it come back up uh, to pay for shoring up the ACA or, or establishing a public option like um, Vice President Biden wants to do as president? Um, that's, that's sort of in the unknowable column. Um, the, it, it, also, go ahead, Christian. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. It, it, it's worth noting, by the way, that um, Biden is a creature of the Senate. Uh, he, he, yes, he was, he was Obama's vice president, but he was a longtime senator. Um, and he's very much an institutionalist. Um, very much an institutionalist. And, and you know, I think if you were to ask Biden, you know, behind closed doors, whether he was in favor of, of eliminating the filibuster and doing some of these things that Democrats are talking about. My guess is that he would probably say no. Um, I, I think that he, he very much reveres the Senate and Senate procedures and, and sort of the, the traditional institutions of democracy. So it'll be interesting uh, to, to, to see if Biden becomes president and if the Democrats take control of the Senate, where Biden comes out on all of this, um, because he, he, he may not be an enthusiast uh, for, some of these, for some of these procedural reforms, given his long history uh, as an institutional member of Congress. Well, they've certainly tried to buttonhole him on the court packing question. Um, you know, he's, he's avoided that to date. Um, but, you know, he's also got some ambitious legislative priorities that he's, that he's come out and, you know, committed to, not only come out in favor, but committed to. Um, you know, he's, 
the, the tax bill from three years ago, the, the Republican drafted tax reform bill in 2017, lowered, as everyone knows, the corporate tax rate from 35 all the way down to 21. He's committed to moving it back up to 28 to try to, to, try to pay for some of these um, uh, priorities. There's absolutely no way to do that um, without getting rid of the filibuster. I mean, it's just, I, I just don't see any path to 60 votes to, to bumping up the corporate tax rate 7% after three years of, uh, of where it's been. So, so yeah, I think that um, it will all be very interesting to see. And there's, there's a lot more than what gets headlines in, in terms of, uh, of uh, you know, trying to, trying to pin down Biden on things like court backing and where he stands on the institutions. That's a great point. Um, and then, you know, we, we want to get into this as little as possible because I think it's, it's so hard to, um, to predict, but we are, um, you know, we are all well aware that this, that this administration, both pre and during the pandemic has, has, um, has affected this industry uniquely, um, you know, some for the good and some for the bad. I think uh, it's, it's not clear what uh, a President Biden's tariff strategy would look like and, um, and the impact on a global supply chain under, under a Biden White House versus what we've been experiencing more recently. Um, but I think it's fair to say that it would change. Um, I think that there's a lot of focus on uh, an emphasis on reshoring medtech production as a result of the pandemic and uh, and sort of shoring up the the national stockpile. Um, but there's also on the on the other side, there's also a lot of um, focus on on expediting and 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 allowing uh, industry to bring to market quicker and more effectively um, or efficiently new products. So. Um, a lot of that is, I, I, I would say, in the unknowable column, but um, certainly up for up for debate and up for change. Um, we're not yet at the point of um, full-on speculation as to as to the you know the Biden cabinet or other political appointees. We have heard some some names floated for HHS secretary, including uh, I think I saw Karen Bast, she's a member of Congress from California. Um, and Governor Grisham from from uh, New Mexico are candidates for for HHS. This is one of the things that drives um, transition teams crazy. Uh, the the sort of jockeying for these positions um, before the before the election, but it but it's sort of a parlor game that happens every four years. I don't think it's worth um, you know bracing for or, or strategizing around, but. Uh, there will certainly be change, and there will be change at the FDA too. As much as we like that um, critical safety agency to be apolitical, um, it's the president's prerogative to appoint a commissioner. So we'll see. Um, we'll 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 see in January and in the months that follow what uh, what changes the the White House will bring, regardless of who wins, to uh, to the administration and the and the leaders throughout the cabinet and government. I think now is a good time to open it up to questions. Christian, unless I've missed anything that you want to cover before we take some. No, I think, I think you got it. Yeah. I didn't, I wasn't following the chat bot, but Brian, did you see any come in already? Yeah, there is, uh, they are starting to come in, but I, I have a few questions that I just kind of wanted to tee up here because I think they're, they're important. Um, Great. It, it looks like we're looking at a rebuild of the ACA, you know, whether or not that's, you know, a full overhaul or putting new tires on the car. Um, I guess maybe Christian, uh, since you've had a background in the Senate, you know, when we look at the ACA, I don't think anybody in med tech forgets what happened 10 years ago uh, when the medical device excise tax comes out of Max Baucus's office. But how much difference do you think the COVID pandemic has reframed debate around the ACA? Um, we've watched it become more popular over the years, but um, do you think that there's the AC, uh, the fact that they're going to have to relitigate this in the middle of a pandemic uh, pushes us more towards more government intervention or less? I, I would I would I would say probably more. Um, 
I, th I think the ACA in, in a lot of ways represents what Republicans originally feared back when Clinton tried to pass um, health care legislation. There's a lot of documentation at the time that said that Newt Gingrich really wanted to oppose that effort because the worry is, is that once you establish a government entitlement program, it gains a lot of popularity. And you've seen that with the ACA quite a bit. Um, a law that was initially very unpopular um, and in fact led to the 2010 election in which the House flipped and uh, Democrats lost a lot of seats in the Senate. Now a majority of Americans are, are find it popular and red states, for instance, have expanded Medicaid coverage under the ACA. I mean, it really has become sort of, a, a, as, as many conservatives have feared, a, a sort of popular government entitlement program. And if, if, if the ACA is struck down, and, and I think there's a very good chance that it will be, and you have to rebuild it, as you say, uh, Brian, I think that you, you know, industry needs to brace for more government intervention, not less. I think, uh, I think it will just simply embolden Democrats to be more ambitious uh, and to explore issues, not necessarily the medical uh, uh, device tax, uh, but certainly things like the government uh, option, um, uh, that will certainly be on the table. Uh, uh, so yeah, I, 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 I expect more government inter intervention, not, not less. <clears throat> Thanks. And, and, you know, I, I think also, um, th it seems like that the ACA, no matter who wins the election, is still kind of going to be the framework. I mean, you're not going to be able, I mean, is it politically, I, I don't think it's politically smart to remove pre-existing conditions. I mean, uh, I just, I mean, I can't imagine anyone who actually wants to win an election. Although, I mean, I guess you could say if, if, Donald, if President Trump wins, then, you know, he, he doesn't need to run again. But I, I, I mean, the ACA would still be the framework, right, for any new plan. I haven't seen any competing plan come out of the Republican committees. I, I would assume that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, there, 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 I mean, the only thing that we've seen Republican real action on, Brian, relative to this is drug pricing. Um, you know, and of course that's a, maybe a, a, a tiny corner of the, of the debate, um, certainly doesn't address coverage. Um, but I mean, it's possible that absent ACA, we go back to the, you know, the way markets worked pre ACA. Mm -hmm. Um, and that that's what Mitch McConnell wants and that's what the Republican party is committed to. And yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Eliminating pre coverage for pre-existing conditions is a loser, but you know, we lived like that for a long time. Yeah. Can, sorry. Can I just say something? Is that all right if I speak? No, by all means. Sure. Um, the way I understood pre-existing conditions many years ago is that it really had to do with people who did not have coverage and then became sick and decided that they should then get coverage. Much the, the same way as if you don't have home insurance and your house burns down, you then say, oh, I should get home insurance. It doesn't work that way. You can't have it that way. You need to have the coverage before the incident. But somehow, so, so it was intended to discourage people from, or disallow people really, from having from getting coverage only when they need it and not when they don't need it because it's insurance so it builds up you can't just have insurance only when you need it but somehow the whole discussion has seemed to turn towards any kind of pre-existing condition you've ever had even if you've had coverage since you were a child and that's not really what it's meant to be it's meant to prevent people from not get from opting out of coverage until they need it, and then why would anybody get coverage at all if they don't need it? Why wouldn't everybody just wait until they, you know, they have stage four cancer or they get hit by a truck? What's the point of having coverage if you can get it after the incident? So I'm just wondering how that discussion changed and how we can kind of get it back onto track. It's not just a discussion, but it's, it's a description, really, is what it is, the definition. Yeah, Susan, I mean, I think it, it becomes a discussion because it's a, a very powerful political tool that can be used to elicit a very emotional response and motivate others. Um, 
So but it's not the correct, but they're not using the correct definition. Well, I think, I don't know if that's ever stopped our lawmakers in the past <laughs> on that issue that they want to create uh, impact on, but it's a very good point. No, but I understand that. But even amongst our little discussion here, you know, we talk, keep talking about pre-existing conditions and canceling pre-existing conditions. I mean, at least amongst ourselves and amongst, you know, the, the medical profession, or we should know that it really just means people who did not get coverage, who did not have coverage until they got sick. It doesn't mean that if you've had coverage and you don't like your insurance company, you can't change because you're, you're already sick. You can't change. You can change as long as you've had coverage continuously. And I think the way the discussion is, and um, is that, you, you, you know, if, if, if you've had coverage, you can never switch because you have this pre-existing condition. And that's just not accurate. And I just think that as people in the medical field, um, you know, tangential medical field, we should really make, make others aware of what the actual meaning is. Because of course, I mean, if you have had coverage your entire life or even the past 10 years, and you want to switch your, your insurance company, um, you should be able to, even if you have a pre-existing condition because you've been covered. But if you haven't been covered and you get sick, I'm not so sure you should be allowed to get coverage just when you get sick. That's the real issue. Well, I, I appreciate you bringing up the point. I want to sort of keep this discussion going, so we'll acknowledge, we'll acknowledge that. Um, but I'd like to get, I think there's a couple things that I wanted to just pull back into on the presentation, guys. It, it appears that our delegation will be more powerful now than in several decades. What, um, you know, given the fact that we're going to have the chairman of the House Ways and Means, given the fact that we're going to have a, potentially Nancy Pelosi's number two in the, in, the, in the House, given the fact that we're going to have, we have some committee members, committee leaderships, for policy purposes, how let's get a little bit more sort of nitty gritty down to the grant granular here. What, how do you actually make that work for you as an employer, as a citizen? What's, I mean, you know, and how do we sort of crystallize that um, so that people understand, you know, you have, there now we have an opportunity within our delegation to impact policy. What's the best way to kind of try to build those bridges? Yeah, I think what um, what's what's often missed is that um, you know we, we have these national conversations, and you know as, as we just discussed, the 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 definitions change or get or or you know get co-opted and and twisted, and you know that that happens. Um, but at the end, it, it kind of goes to that maxim from the very beginning. Um, the people making these decisions about policy are also, first and foremost, representatives of a district. So just because Richie Neal is in the room with the Speaker and the Majority Leader of the Senate and hashing out um, the, you know, the final bill um, on something that affects 350 million Americans doesn't mean that he isn't also thinking about Springfield and the First District and the state of Massachusetts and his delegation. Um, so, you, you know, I think what you have now is a, is outsized influence on, on policy by literally having a seat at the table. Um, I think that begins with engagement as, you know, the, the, the more and the better you're able to tell that story and explain the nuance, um, you know, push back on, on, um, narratives that are, you know, either, you know, liberal with the facts or, or, or just anti-factual as, as in some cases they, they might be, um, you know, you've got, you've got a, a sympathetic ear and, and more importantly, someone who can actually act on it. And, you know, Christians work for a lot of very powerful members of Congress and, and, uh, you know, both in the House and the Senate. I mean, you can speak to this firsthand. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, Grant, I, I, I have 20 years on the Hill, so, you know, 
I am I am the I am the Washington insider that is often demonized uh, by 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 sort of you know the populist notion nowadays. But members of Congress do listen and care about what their constituents want. They really do. And and a lot of the gridlock that you have in Washington is not so much members themselves. It's because members' constituents see <laughs> issues in a very different way. I mean, Senator Warren's constituents in Massachusetts look at the world a very different way than Senator Cruz's constituents do in Texas. I mean, that, that's just a fact. Um, but that's my long way to, when, when to, winded way of saying that Anthony's right. You have to engage. I mean, you have to engage with your member offices. You have to let them know where your positions are. You have to sort of hold them accountable and let them know that that you will be remembering the the, the positions that they take on election day. Um, there's a saying in Washington that if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu. Uh, so it's imperative that you really want to be at the table. Um, you really want to make sure that, uh, and from the ground floor, not at the end stages of the game, but at the beginning stages of the game, uh, so that so that members are aware of of the positions that that your members take. It's, it's very important. So that means calling your district director, or your director, district officer out at your local congressional leader's office, right, guys? I mean, you can pick up the phone and call them, and even as just a citizen or a sole proprietor, and express them your uh, beliefs and, 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 and things like that. I think um, absolutely, and more and more organized engagement works as well. I mean, yeah. you know, as 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 a former staffer, I mean. You know, members will always instruct their staff. You know, you may not get a, me a, a members will always usually meet with their own their own constituents uh, from their own state or their own district. Um, but staff are, is almost always instructed to be available for 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 these uh, meetings as well. And, and directly engaging with them in Washington is also very very effective. Yeah. <clears throat> I think you know, Brian, to your to your point, um, and to the credit of Mass Medic, this is exactly the kind of organization that helps facilitate that. You're stronger in, in numbers, you know, where you can reach consensus, um, you know, you're, you're better able to move the ball. And I think Bob just brought something up that we haven't really discussed, but for a passing mention of the CR, um, it's not just legislation and, and debates about coverage or, or, or otherwise, it's, um, it's funding, you know, it's R&D money coming back to the district. And, you know, Catherine Clark, in addition to, you know, a leadership job is, a, is an appropriator on on the HHS subcommittee, um, you know, opportunity to bring to bring money back to the state to uh, you know to 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 bolster and, and further the uh, the public funded into, uh, incubators of of med tech and, and otherwise in life sciences. So, you know, that stuff doesn't happen without effective and consistent advocacy. So I I applaud you all for for doing that and for Brian for sort of shepherding that. Yeah, I mean, thanks. I mean, long story short, guys, I mean, the thing that I think that regardless of what happens um, in the next two weeks, Massachusetts has a moment right now where we have outs almost outsized uh, representation given, you know, or, or maybe if you consider how much stuff we build here and how much economic activity and global activity we create, we have a key opportunity with these leadership positions in the House to really... Um, shape and influence national policy. So I just, if you, if you don't take anything else out of this preview, I really want that you to drive that home is that it is likely that your congressional uh, representative now has outsized power than what they had uh, previously. And, and if the Senate flips, yes, we'll probably have even more influence. But currently right now in the House of Representatives, we have an incredible uh, incredibly deep and powerful delegation. So use, use that to your advantage. Um, create those relationships and make your voice, make sure your voice is heard because if anything, what I've seen from Christian and Anthony's presentation, it's that we are about to enter an incredibly, uh, I don't know if fluctuous is a word, but I mean, I don't know if I've ever, I've never seen a situation in my life where you have a the balance of the Supreme Court changing within the two weeks of the balance of power in Washington changes within another few weeks of one of our main, uh, you know, tools by which we conduct healthcare in our country also changing. I mean, this is all happening within the next three to four weeks. So what we do, you know, how we think about how we're going to protect our jobs and our industry and how we're going to move our industry forward is going to interact and intertwine with public policy. 
And so we have to just, I wanted to make sure that everybody could understand that. And thank you to Anthony and Christian for, for driving that home uh, today. So Rachel, that's, uh, I think we're bumping up against the clock here. I think there's been a lot of great conversation. Um, I think we probably could go for longer, but I wanted to uh, just recognize that we, we told people we'd go till about one o'clock and we're a couple of minutes over. Yeah, absolutely. So please everyone and join me in saying thank you to Anthony and Christian and Brian and Brian for, for all of your thoughts today. Really do appreciate you guys um, putting this together. I think it was really incredibly helpful. So uh, thank you everyone for joining. We, we hope to see you again very soon at another event. And uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. We'd love to chat more about this and other topics. So everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Take care. Go vote. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>